Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who enjoys learning technical subjects. Awesome, you're with me and it's day six troubleshooting Windows applications. Let's get started. My career tip for day six is how to advance your career in IT. And in reality, there's really nothing different in advancing your career in IT than in any other career. You know, as I reflect on my career, I saw many, many talented, smart, so capable, young men leave our program and go into the workforce in IT. And they did not do well. They had seemingly everything you would ever want and yet they didn't do well and i saw them 20 years later and they still were going nowhere i also saw many many young men leave our program and go into the field and they did so well it's amazing how well they did they all had very similar characteristics and i'm going to talk about them all of the men and women who did well in IT always were people who kept learning. They never stopped pushing their career, learning, mastering new skills. They also were people who showed up to work every day on time. Better yet, get to work before you have to. I can't tell you how important that simple thing is is very important that you learn people i mean you learn people well take some time in your career to read books study learn the psychology of understanding people so that when you run into different types of people you are at an advantage you understand that kind of person you understand this kind of attitude and this kind of behavior it helps you immensely avoid conflict deal with people in a positive way rather than reaction. Learning people is so important in this field. If you want to advance your career, grow up and show some responsibility. I can't tell you how much maturity is a heavily demanded trait in our field. Do your job without oversight from your supervisor. When I started teaching, I was 24 years old and I can tell you my classroom was visited by my administration team pretty regularly. They would come in and see this young whippersnapper in the classroom and they would check to make sure one I showed up, two I was doing my job and just what was going on. But over time, especially as my career advanced, I showed up on time, I did my job, I wasn't out of the classroom, I was doing what I was supposed to do. I saw less and less and less till towards the end of my career I may see my, my boss in the hallway once a week, that tells you you're doing your job. Show genuine respect for your supervisors. That doesn't mean you have to agree with them on everything. It doesn't mean you don't have a face-to-face -face conversation with them. But listen, they're people too, and they've got a lot on their plate. And being genuine with those that oversee you is a huge issue. Now we've talked about Windows apps, and I, you know how I feel about the Windows Store. We've talked about Android apps. Both of those we'll have to just wait and see and see how that really plays out over time. But this, what's right before you right now, is where the gold is. Right now Microsoft supports the Windows subsystem for Linux. And you can download various command line shells and they run fine on Windows. But what everybody wants is the, the graphical applications that run on Linux to be also to be able to run those graphical programs on the Windows subsystem for Linux on Windows. That's a mouthful. Right now Microsoft is working on a GUI front end to their subsystem for Linux. If they pull that off well and we can start running Linux applications as well as Windows applications on one single platform. It's going to be a gold mine for Linux developers and a great opportunity for Windows individuals to really take advantage of the wealth of Linux applications that are out there. This 
is the most exciting part. So here's an example of the Microsoft Store having the Ubuntu. So you can download it and you can see the command line here on the screen. You can take a look at this YouTube video where the developer who's doing a blog post on what they're doing in Microsoft to allow GUI Linux apps to run in Windows. And here's a block diagram of what they're doing. They're actually allowing an RDP protocol to talk to a remote desktop connection that will host Linux GUI applications. So there you go. You got your Linux desktop and this is going to be so cool. Often troubleshooting applications will get an error message that pops up on the desktop. Sometimes like this one is pretty clear. It gives us enough information that we can kind of figure out what's going on, but all too often the error message pops up and it's about as helpful it's not helpful at all what can be more puzzling what application on the desktop running is generating the error message from the error message I can't determine much of anything except that it's an error message but I need to know what application what process is generating this error message Mark Rosinovich found himself in those same situations so he built on the menu bar a crosshair icon you can click it and drag it over any desktop message box and then it will pop up process explorer highlighting the process from which the error message is generated while we're here on the menu bar I also did a breakout of all the other items on the menu bar you can find those in the slides now when it comes to installing third-party applications on Windows one of my most favorite programs and companies is the company night night now they have a home product and they have a commercial product they allow you to come down I will slide down here and we can select from a wide variety of the typical applications that home users need or want they've got imaging programs web browsers media players they've got PDF the client for online storage they've got utilities such as team viewer just a wealth of tools for many home users and they give it away for free now I want to tell you these companies don't have to give it away I have a great deal of respect for the leadership of this company to make this decision take a great commercial product that they sell and give away a portion of their profits and the money that they generate to the public that is a great service they do it well as I can come down I'm gonna choose Firefox and let's do discord I'm just picking a couple Dropbox and I'll just choose Python now once I've selected these I can come down it will go ahead and build a custom installer you can see it popped up and I'll say go ahead and I'm going to just go ahead and open it and it runs the executable and you can see the installer run and I'll pop the show details and you can actually see what's happening with my various third-party applications what makes this company so great not only is their generosity to the public but they do this very well I'm gonna go back to their main page slide down and you can look at this list of things that night night promises you as you do the installation and use their tool these are the very things that you want in other words they start working as soon as you run it they don't bother you with choices or options they install the app in their default location they don't add any junk no toolbars no malware they install the right bit for your operating system they install if you choose languages it will install apps with languages it all works in the background they're up to date they're from the publishers official site you can verify digital signatures and hashes before running anything they recommend that this is just a great product so here's the end it's finished it's installed all of the applications that I ask and if you'll notice on my desktop you begin to see all my icons showing up for that product but let's be honest when we send these laptops and PCs back to our family and friends we've only done half the battle because if they're not getting patched those third-party applications are not getting patched they just have a security hazard every day on their desktop another company I admire the leadership of this company they sell it's called patch 
watch my PC, they have a very nice commercial product that they sell to the enterprise. And it allows them to patch third-party applications that they have in their company. They have a portion of their product that they give away free. Listen, they don't have to do that. And I really appreciate when I see leadership of a company that says, we're going to give back to the community. We're going to take our talents and skills. And they obviously can do this. They sell this product. And we're going to give it back free to the home user. And the home user desperately needs this. So you can come over to the tab where it says home users. Click on that. And here you can just slide down the download patch my PC updater. We're going to click on that. You can see it gives me a save as. And I'm going to go ahead and save that in my downloads. What I love about this product, it's a portable app. You don't have to install it. So here's patch my PC. I'm going to double click it. And it goes and scans your PC for every third part application that it supports. It does support everything. And it will look at everything that you have on your PC that it does have the ability to patch. And it will show you and it'll just say all your apps are up to date. So nine of nine apps are up to date. But if you didn't have an app up to date, you could simply click the button and it would start bringing the updates for that application. Super easy to use, portable, it's free. You may be thinking that processes running in user mode have been around forever. They have not. In fact, with Microsoft, it wasn't until Windows 2000 that we actually had our first operating system on a desktop that actually used a process. That was a game changer. Remember, processes do not share memory spaces. They're like silos containers and they prevent one application from crashing another application. This stability and reliability was a amazing. Now threads in a process do share the same memory space and that's why they crash. That's why a process typically will crash. It's not the process but the threads inside. Processes also talk to each other. They're in their own silos and they talk to each other via IPC, inter-process communication. Those rigid rules of how to share data from one process to another, how to communicate from one process to another, is what brings stability to the operating system. Let's Let's take a look at this diagram because it shows my kernel, my hardware drivers, my HAL.DLL, which are all below the kernel mode. And then above you have all your services and then the applications that you're running. And these are all, anything in user mode is in a process. My first ex serious exposure to Windows was when it launched Windows 3.11 for work groups. It had separation between user mode and kernel, but there were no processes and applications all shared the same memory space. I could rarely get to lunchtime without having to reboot my PC, usually maybe even twice in the morning, twice in the afternoon. That was the stability of Windows. Now, Windows is not the only operating system that uses processes and IPCs, inter-process communication. In fact, all modern operating systems, Android, iOS, Mac OS, Linux, they all leverage this type of technology and this type of design, that design gives them the stability they all enjoy. Processes require IPC, inter-process communication. If I've got PowerPoint up and I want, and I've got Word up, and I want to copy some content from Word into PowerPoint. Well, there are two different processes. There is a rigid set of inter-process communications that allow me to copy and paste without one or both crashing. The IPCs you see in this slide are all supported by Windows. Linux supports many of these same IPCs. Now, every operating system may not support all the IPCs that Windows supports, but almost all operating systems will share enough of these IPCs that they can talk to each other. Let's turn our attention to what are handles, how do they operate in processes. When threads are run inside of a process, they require things like files, folders, session information, registry keys, Windows station information, desktop information, synchronization of objects. Everything that I just mentioned is a handle. When threads claim or say this file is used in our process, or a thread says this folder is used in our process, they can lock that folder or lock that file so that nobody else can use it. That doesn't mean that all threads do that, but threads can. So here's an example. I'm trying to delete a file and notice the error message. It says this file is opened in another process and it's locked that file. 
Now, all of you have experienced handles. You just didn't understand what they were. Let's take a look and see how Process Explorer allows us to work with processes and threads that have handles on files and folders that we're trying to work with. So I've got my application and I've got a document, Save Me Please from IT, and I have saved it in this location. I saved this document in my documents and it's called Save Me Please from IT.ODT. That's the extension. I'm going to go to Process Explorer and I'm going to come up to the binoculars and I'm going to say find a process that has a handle or DLL with the words save me. So that's our document name and we're just going to say search. And it says sOffice.bin is the process that has this handle. There's a handle and it owns that handle. Now I'm going back to my file system and under documents, I'm going to create a new folder. So I'm going to call it secrets. So now there's a subdirectory under documents called secrets and I'm going to save my file again. This time I'm going to save it in the secrets folder. So I'm going to say put my document in documents subdirectory secrets. And if I look in that location, I can open up this subdirectory. There's my file. Now that application now has a handle on my file name and that new folder name that I saved it into. Let's go back up to my binoculars. And this time I'm just going to put in the word secret, which is the name of the folder, not the file, the folder. But because I saved my file in this folder, now this process has a handle on the folder as well as the file. Let's take a look. Go search. And now we see explore and my process sOffice.bin all have a handle to this new folder. Many times as a tech you're in an a process is registry area and you're trying to modify a registry key and you can't because that process has a handle to a registry key and has locked it. You can't touch it until that process gives it up. Now watch as we move, we close out the application, it's going to release its handle on the file and that folder called secrets. Then I'm going to move Explorer away from Documents Secret Folder and say put Explorer on the desktop and it will release its handle on that folder. So let's start with the Explorer. I'm going to move Explorer to desktop. It's no longer looking at Documents. It's no longer looking at the Secrets folder. Then I'm going to close out this Word document and we'll go back and say who has a handle on the string called secrets. Nobody. All of those processes released their handles to those folders and files. Now you can go in there and delete unless you don't have rights. Because handles are resources that processes use, threads are using. It is very important that you know the handle count of your entire operating system and the handle count of each and every process. Those are red flags to potential problems. We used to support a medical program that ran a real basic client software on the PC and the back end was an SQL server on an older server that we had. And the server would crash and burn constantly. And every time I would pop up Process Explorer, I would see the handle count on that one database would be over 100,000. I could not communicate with the developers that we had a problem. But as usual, somebody in, in another department bought this software from a vendor, threw it at the IT team and said, install it and make it work. Nobody sized the server for this application and it was a disaster. Thank mm -hmm. you.